Welcome back to Soviet Space Program. March 1957. The second R-7 of the program is launched. This one is for the polar contract, requiring a 400 kilogram payload. Compared to the first one off the production line, continual increase of staffing and engineering efficiency is now getting this built in about five months instead of 10. Going polar takes a bit more energy to orbit, but that is not a concern for this oversized launch vehicle. Like the previous launch, this one will use a U-2000 as the final stage to put it into a low orbit. To take advantage of the polar launch, the video imaging experiment is included as well as the magnetic scan to continue gathering science. The 87 degree inclination will mean that the probe will fly over all biomes across Earth after a period of time. Given the capability of the R7, enough battery was included with the probe so that 30 days of magnetic scan can be transmitted in its entirety. So we can expect to receive all the magnetic scan and video imaging signs from Earth Space Low. We received the message that the polar contract is complete as well as completion of all objectives for the early satellite program. With 10 signs in the reserves, 1958 orbital rocketry is bought in to get the RD-0105, which will be our first usable upper stage. Now that all objectives are complete for the early satellite program, we take a quick break into admin to review our plans. There's just a little under a year remaining in the early satellite program, but the funding is so good that I will run this program until the deadline. Early Earth observation sats only needs a single program slot, so I plan on upgrading the admin building soon so we can have three programs running simultaneously. Similarly, Early Commercial Applications is another one-slot program with the same payout, but without any scientific objectives. We will likely take this one later so that we can focus on continuing to bring in more science in the short term. By the middle of May, research for lunar range communications is completed, followed by reaching 500 engineers for the R7 complex. Then, 50 more researchers are added to the auto hire queue to expedite 1958 orbital rocketry. We have some time before a lunar attempt can be made, so an optional contract is flown in the meantime. It's important to keep flying missions throughout the year as reputation decays over time impacting the subsidy received to help pay for facilities and staff. It's also important to build up the engine run times as this increases the reliability of the engines for future flights. This specific contract requires 1,000 units of sounding payload to reach 6,000 kilometers downrange. Peaking at 250 kilometers, the core stage reaches engine cutoff and releases the payload. This could have stayed on the core stage, but we decouple for that dramatic effect. We get the notification of success and exceed the contract requirements by over 1,000 kilometers. The 375 confidence was a nice reward, so this contract was well worth it. We switch our focus now to upgrading the tracking station to level two, which will unlock patched conics in orbit. This facility upgrade will cost 540 funds per day, so we can't afford any integration of another R7 in the meantime. The early video imaging and magnetic scan has generated enough science points for a few more tech nodes. What I decide to invest in are entry, descent, and landing, and 1958 primitive solar panels. After passing some time to the completion of 1958 orbital rocketry, I head into the VAB to prep the lunar impactor. The original Luna 1 rocket was flown with a direct descent for the lunar impact trajectory. I don't want to deal with that hassle, so some design changes are needed to get that upper stage light enough to be inserted into orbit by the R7 stack. The RDO 105 only has a single ignition, so the stage needs to be small enough for the R7 booster and core to bring it into orbit. The R7 core avionics are upgraded to 300 tons controllable mass and early avionics. The RD-0107 and 108 are changed to the 8D-74 and 75 configs. 
This time around, there's plenty of unlocked credit, so these upgrades and tooling will not dip into the banked funds. After all purchasing is done, the extra funds are used to get another 65 engineers to further speed up integration times. December 13, Luna 1 lifts off from the pad. We have lucked out with the transfer window during the daytime, so we will get some nice shots during the launch. We have a successful orbital insertion, and now have to work against the clock to plot a maneuver before we lose communications with the ground. Then, the command is initiated just barely before we fall out of communications range. The RDO 105 has a starting reliability of 85%, so we run a fairly high risk of this failing. And a breath of fresh air. And the flight plan plots a close flyby. We wait to get back into communications range, and then trim with RCS to modify the course for an impact. With the course correction set, we give a small spin up, then release the impactor. The probe cannot generate any power as it makes its way to the moon, but it has been packed with enough batteries to make that transit. The great part about the lunar impactor is that this will be the first large wave of science, as you are passing through Earth space high and then are able to get data in moon space high and low. As we approach the moon, we have already gathered 56 science, and get the notification that we succeeded in various speed records, altitude records, as well as completing the lunar flyby. With the probe speeding towards the surface, it gathers what little science it can in low lunar space. Then, impact. We get a double space gazette for the flyby and impactor contracts. But more importantly, we got a whole lot of science as well as an extra 75 applicants which was awarded from the flyby. Something that might be overlooked is that science gathering also feeds into confidence, so that has now bumped to almost 1100. With the 77 science points, I now start to queue up early human spaceflight material science, early flight control, human rated EDL, crew survivability, and early human spaceflight electronics research. We have research now set for the next three years, but it would be better to get that done much sooner. All 75 applicants from the flyby contract are hired as researchers, but with the extra funding that has collected over the past several days, I keep hiring until I'm at 570 researchers, leaving enough to start building another lunar impactor. That's it for 1957. It was definitely a successful year and we have some planned growth coming up. Thanks for watching and see you on the next one.